and find being organized yeah. is is a really important thing as a music producer. If you're really serious about this, be organized. Like, do not be someone who just makes every tr- beat you ever make in Ableton is called track audio one, audio two, three audio, four audio, five audio, six audio, seven audio, eight audio. That's that's amateur hour. Like, don't do that. If you're gonna lay down, if it's like a bass, name that shit bass, <laughs> you know, and color code your tracks. That's even more the pro move. You know, whatever makes sense for you. I could open any session I've ever made and just looking at it, these are all purple drums, the dark purple, that's my kick, this is my crash, that's my ride. Yellow is bass, reds are electric guitars, orange is like organic acoustic guitar, sub bass is mustard yellow. It's like, I have my own method. Vocals are always this color, harmonies are this. It's like, it just makes it so much easier. And um, I think a lot of producers will say this, this is so important, especially if you're newer to the game. Is, is you don't always feel inspired to make music, but if you want to be like working towards being productive and growing as a producer. You're listening to the Free of Music Podcast. To the Free of Music Podcast. I'm Gabe Lehner and I make music under the moniker Nine Theory and I am currently based out of Los Angeles, California. What brought you into music initially? What initially got me into music was um so my dad my dad is in always been in bands and still is in bands. And so when I was a teenager, I think I was 15, um, he was playing, just this mic, he was playing uh, a gig at a nearby elementary school um, in Encinitas Village Park there. It was an ice cream social. And uh, I was just walking around cruising. And then I came to where the band was and they were playing that song, Louie Louie. Um, And he went into this guitar solo and he just sh- ripped it. Like my dad shreds a guitar. He just rocked this solo. And I was watching it like, I was kind of like, damn, my dad can shred like that. I guess I didn't realize that yet. And in that moment, I was, I said, I want to do that. I want to be able to do that. And that that was it. There was no going back. Um, I had dabbled with trying to learn guitar before. Um, from him and never really cared or stayed interested. But once I saw that happen and I was older and 15, um, then that was it. And so when I got into music, I was just wanting to get really good at guitar and play lead. And I just listened to BB King and Buddy Guy like crazy and jammed with the records and was trying to be a like blues guitarist. That's how I got into it. Great. And how were you able to teach yourself from Buddy Guy? And, and like, what were the strategies or techniques that you used to, to learn? Uh, I didn't have to teach myself. I had my dad to teach okay. me whenever I wanted, Nice, which is cool. So I, I never once had the, the music lesson thing. A lot of kids, you know, want to learn an instrument. Their parents have them take music lessons. My dad um, played guitar and, and knows music theory. And so he just informally whenever I wanted, it'd be like, can you show me this? How do I play this? I want to learn this Beatles song or he'd show me here. Here's how you do a bar chord. So um, I never felt like I was taking lessons, but my dad taught me music. And what was it about his style? I appreciate that. 
that he was able to make it fun for you and it was kind of casual and you'd approach him and, and try and learn yeah. something new that was relevant to you. He wasn't trying to push you towards right. whatever the blues or how to play X, Y, or Z. So what was it about his style of teaching that was so like approachable or friendly and like, I'm, I'm just curious, like what, what could a music teacher learn from your father? I don't know. It was just, cause it didn't even feel like, um, lessons or any, you know, it wasn't structured. It, it was really just me trying to figure wanting to learn guitar and, and play lead. So he'd say, here's the pentatonic minor pentatonic pattern, main one that you should learn first and do this. And so if you do this over in, you know, this BB King song is in B minor, let's say the thrill is gone. And so if you start your finger here and you play this, listen, how that's cool, you know, or, um, here's how you play each chord. Here's, here's how you practice putting them together. And, um, yeah, it was just cool. Cause it's my dad, you know, it, it was, it was, like I said, super unstructured, but so it was just constant. It was whenever I wanted to learn something new or he thought it was time for me to learn something new, I guess it just, just give me more knowledge. That's great. Yeah. And when did you start transitioning from learning how to play others songs or asking your dad, how do I ex you know, do something to creating your own music or to thinking, actually, I, I should make something from scratch. Obviously with the guitar, it's pretty easy to combine chords and then start realizing it. Wait a second, nobody's <laughs> ever done this. But when did you start kind of, uh, you know, pursuing your own craft? Instantly. I mean, instantly. Every time. I, I, I more than anything, would consider myself a songwriter first, even I'm a songwriter who became a producer on accident, I guess. Um, and so when I first started learning guitar and at the time also when I was 15, I was so obsessed with the Beatles. I was actually, you know, I was known throughout my high school as the that Beatles guy, that weird dude who's super into the Beatles. We had one of those too. <laughs> Even if people, yeah, so that was me. Even if someone didn't know my name, it's like, it's the Beatles guy. <laughs> so I instantly also was really interested in learning their songs and studying songwriting. But as soon as I started learning guitar and, and uh, one of my buddies, um, Chuckles, as he went by at the time, uh, we hung out after school all the time. And so all I knew how to do first off the bat when I was like, let me start learning guitar was play the bottom E string, right? And just put my finger on different frets on just the bottom E string and play single notes. And we wrote a song, like we started writing songs. We wrote a song called, uh, I forget what it's called, but it was basically at the time as the OJ Simpson trial. And we wrote a song about how Judge Ito was actually who did it. And all I can remember is, I still somehow remember the hook. It went like, <laughs> um, it was Ito, it was Ito, who would suspect the judge? It was Ito, it was Ito. And something about like, if the glove didn't fit, I don't remember anymore, but. Nice. So, so out of the gate, I was learned, I was already interested in writing original music. Yeah. And creating that it just was like, it was just how it was. Yeah. And did yeah, you it wasn't start even recording? like a decision? No, that, well, that came, uh, yeah, came pretty early on, but so at the same time I started learning guitar, my best friend, Brandon started learning guitar and so we started kind of writing songs together. I mean, crude, right? Like we both sucked at guitar and we're just learning to write songs. And, but we were really into Oasis and Blur and the Beatles and all the cool Brit pop stuff. So we were writing cool stuff. And then his friend, Kevin, he's like, I have a friend writing songs also. And then when we met just the three of us, were just never looked back. Like we were a band for 10 years, but we started out as kids learning our instruments, just sucking, but writing songs. And um, Brandon invested in a Tascam Porta studio, like all in one unit where you record cassette tapes. That's awesome. And so we just, it, 
you know, it was, it was like, okay, let's record our, let's record stuff. And, and even before that, it was just um, <laughs> a cassette tape in a little, you know, like radio with where you could hit record and just recording us in the room. So I guess it was very early being interested in getting the ideas recorded and started producing before I knew what the term producing meant. I didn't even know it was what we were doing, but we started doing that. That's great. And when did you start realizing, or was there a turning point where you were all in and you knew music was your path and that this was going to be the direction? Yeah, I, f f since the beginning also felt that way, like that's what I wanted to do. And I had have all these wonderful fantasy daydreams of making it big or being interviewed on the Jay Leno show and all that kind of With stuff. With the Frio Music Podcast. Yeah, so. even though it didn't exist yet, I foresaw it all. Yeah. Um, but the, 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 the real point was when after high school, I was going to uh, Palomar College, which is one of the community colleges there in San Diego, North County. And one of the main reasons I wanted to go and stay local and go to community college was to still be in my band. Um, the other guys in it were younger than me and still in high school. And we, our band was too cool to, to be like, I'm going to go away to college and our band's over. So... After getting my two years of my G GED, or no, GED is the high school thing, my general ed <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, uh, your requirement classes. Then it was like, well, now what do I do? And, and, and by that time, our band had been, you know, we're older, been playing for years. We were getting really good. And I was so into it. And I just knew... Well, first I, I like I was like, okay, let me go to Miracosta College. They had a recording arts program, and that interested me. So I, I instead of going off to do whatever else, I stayed in community college, but switched to focus on how to learn to be in a studio and record. And that's where I took a class called MIDI or whatever, and learned that you could have a computer program with a little keyboard and hammer out beats and and play loops and and build songs and that blew my mind that was the game changer i mean that's that moment was what turned into a uh, hi i'm nine theory now <laughs> doing what i do but um even it even though i was at miracosta in this music classes i really enjoyed it still wasn't enough um of my, my band was was so important to me that i knew even that was, was like a distraction and, and I had to kind of make a decision and I, my choice was to go all in. And I knew that, um, I believed in myself and my band and I wanted to, even if it didn't work out, know that I tried my best. I did not want to have regret looking back at my life that I never like really gave it my all and went for it to try to have this band, you know, make it or whatever. So I just, I, I stopped going to school. So that was the real moment. And I chose to stop going to college altogether, which was a hard choice because I always took school very seriously. I was a good student. Um, so that was actually a, like a personal struggle to, to make that call, uh, but, but I did. And then of course the band didn't work out, but my path has been on the music path ever since. It's, it has worked out for me. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Great to hear. Yeah. So what was it? It was a MIDI course that in particular yeah. just sparked everything. And yeah, that's because, well, tell me if I'm wrong, but you've been working previously with all analog or like, you know, strings and guitars and, and loops and tapes. But then once you realize it could be digitized, something about that was different that really kind of yeah. grasped you. Well, the recording... I guess the recording on the Tascam unit was analog, but we still had a keyboard, so it'd be fake strings and fake drums. Okay. But you'd have to record that performance and get it, you know. So this blew my mind because it was the MIDI blocks and you draw it you in. Could see you could see it and edit your the... beats and you could quantize it and just say just this part loop and now let me add a bass, now let me add a this. That was a game changer because that made me get 
that setup at home. So now while my band is still being this band, on the side, I'm at home and I started out, maybe I got performer, but for some reason, I very quickly got Reason, the comp, uh, propeller head software Reason, which was, this is great and was awesome at the time. And so I started making all this other music that wasn't the band and really entering that world. And, and I was always so into hip hop. So I started making beats and then I kind of started getting into electronic music and all that was, was at the same time as the band. So when the band didn't work out, I already was on that, on that journey. You already had the uh, escape raft built and uh, yeah, I guess so. the parachute was <laughs> deployed. That's a way, yeah, it's a way to look at it. Tell me about how you came up with Nine Theory, the, the name, and maybe there's a backstory there. Uh, the name Nine Theory, so that came from, you know, it's hard to come up with an original name. First of all, just an original name. It's so hard to come up with a name that's not, if you Google it, already a band or a restaurant or a tech company or some website. And so I, I had just was for, for, I don't know, for weeks, like had this note on my phone, band names, just anytime I think of something cool. It's the longest list. But I kind of got onto this tip of really liking math. Um, I love math, it took a lot of crazy math in college and so I wanted that in my name somehow, some way. And then the word theory was cool. I had all these other math names like calculus and cosine and ideas. Uh, but the number that the name nine theory was just one of many, but I kind of narrowed it down. And, and what ultimately made me go with it um, was when I looked up the spiritual meaning of the number nine. And the first thing I read was uh, an explanation that the number nine represents taking your innate talents and abilities and putting them out into the world in a way that affects positive influence and change. And I was just like, oh my God, that's 100% what I want to do with my art, with my music. Um, so that sealed the deal. And then it was a tip of the hat for me to the Beatles, you know, the famous or infamous number nine, number nine, the weird revolution nine song on the white album. So, so even though it was kind of a math thing and the word theory for me, that's a Beatles thing also. And there's no nine theory. It was totally unique. Even still, if you, if you Google it, nothing but me is nine theory. So that's cool. And a lot of the other names I really liked uh, were taken by something. Yeah, I, I can understand and relate to the difficulty of finding web domains and issues like that. It's hard. That's, yep. I invented a word, or I thought I did, and as it turns out, it means break <laughs> in Portuguese. Uh, right. <laughs> but, uh, you know. So there's know. a bunch of bands. Yeah, there's a bunch of artists called that probably and stuff. Yeah, well, it's like break like a, a car. Uh, Frio, it means break. Um, nice. But uh, anyways, yeah, I, I could definitely understand the difficulty creating a unique name and then needing to kind of incorporate something that resonated with you and finding that math and that you can really dominate nine theory on online. And uh, that's great. What were the, some of the first steps after coming up with the name that you took to kind of create a brand and start to build this out? Uh, that's a good question. L let me get back real okay. quick. One thing about Nine Theory, though, I just thought of. So just, just to explain, too, for anyone listening to this. So it, it, it means to me it's the theory of the number nine. So that's really Nine Theory is like, what's all the theory about what nine is or means? Because also, if you research it um, across kind of all cultures um, and when they attribute m meanings to, to numbers, nine seem to always stick out as being the most powerful, like epic number of all of them for some reason. And I just thought that was so interesting and, and amazing to even more be like, wow, this is a powerful name. So, so I went with that. And then 
So part of that led to the branding. So I also right away was like, well, let's make shirt designs and, and found the Sri Yantra symbol, which I just thought was cool. Um, and I was like, let's take nine of these, let's just a random nine triangles inside of it that look cool and color them in. So it's different than the Sri Yantras you always see. Let's take the circle that's around it away and color in nine triangles. And then when I researched it after we already chose it, the Sri Yantra symbol is nine overlapping triangles that creates like a bunch of triangles inside of it, but it's nine that overlap. I was like, what? That's crazy. It's just meant to be like the nine thing. Um, me, my handwriting hashtag, you know, one, two, three, four slash five, one, two, three, four. Like that was part of my branding. Just like, how could we incorporate nine into stuff? And then my aesthetic has always been into cool artwork and just trying to have a vibe of what I thought was cool. And then the music mainly, what the music sounds like is the brand ultimately. Let's dive into your music and discuss a little bit further some of the tools and strategies that you like to use or that you, if you can generalize, tend to go to. So if you were to open up a blank Ableton project today, you know, where would you start? What it's the foundation for you. Hmm. So Ableton itself, first of all, we should say is, is it my main tool because Ableton is the most incredible DAW. So I used to work on Reason and I've also got Pro Tools back then and have been on Pro Tools forever. But Ableton is just a game changer because it, as a program itself, is more like an instrument and a tool for being creative. And if you just know your way around it and experiment with stuff, happy accidents happen all the time. So I always give my props to Ableton. And I say, uh, you know, a lot of the cool things in my music is me just messing around in Ableton. And then I'm like, oh my God, this is awesome. And then people think I'm a good producer, <laughs> but <laughs> I didn't do it on purpose. It's just cause Ableton is so cool. Um, how I start in Ableton varies. Um, what I used to do all the time, and I think this is what a lot of people newer to production do, is start with making drums, like a drum beat, and then you add music to it. Um, sometimes I still do that, but what I'm more interested in these days is starting with a musical vibe that has no drums yet. Uh, whether it's an inspiring drone on a synth or, or a cool sound that it makes me want to come up with this cool chord progression. Or what I most like to do is have inspiration spark from sampling. So I'll just randomly go through what folder do I want to look at today, right now, and find something that sounds interesting to sample, but really like manipulate it and uh, take a piece and twist it into something that sounds original and unique and just kind of get a vibe. And then it's really fun to have a vibe going and some loops and say, okay, what would be the dopest drums to add to this and then build up your kit. And like, I, I always play my drums by hand, like on a, not pads on the piano key. Cause that's how I've done it since my band, you know, when we started um, doing it on the Elisa's keyboard. So I still like to bang it out on piano keys and, uh, and just come up with the drums that way um, with the music already happening. I, th I feel like that is common. You're right that a lot of people tend to build it with the drums and then, but you're tending to start with more of a melodic or uh, some sort of, as you these said, these the days, music. these days, it's way more common that I will do add drums later once I have something happening that's musically interesting and inspiring. When you're creating a song, do you use live instruments like the instruments over your shoulder or, you know, there's, I think a bass or a guitar. Do you use any of those? Yeah, I've got like a, a Les Paul right oh, here nice. too. Uh, there's a, I don't know if you can see, there's like a Rhodes back there. Yep. See the Rhodes? Um, I have some, you can't see some synths also. Honestly, just to get a vibe going, I'll usually just pull software synths because there's so much good 
stuff there. Um, but uh, what, you know, it's funny is I'm a guitar player. That's what I played in my band, right? Since I was 15, I was like, I want to play guitar. Um, and I don't use it to come up with stuff that much. And I, and I just as of the last couple of days, decided I, that's ridiculous. <laughs> I should change that. That's why it's sitting right next to me right now, plugged in, where I can, you know, I've been making a bunch of beats the past few days and adding guitar to it. And it's awesome. It's like, I play guitar. I should be adding guitar to stuff. So um, I plan to do more of that. I'd want to even, instead of, it's kind of laziness, like, let me pull up a synth bass. It's like, no, let me play my real bass. I want to... I want to start adding more of the live stuff to it, but I do play the roads a lot um, on stuff, which is which is having a real roads is great. There's still no software that sounds like a real roads, in my opinion, at all. Interesting. Yeah, I was going to say it's also a challenge sometimes to get the bass to sound as interesting as a software bass that has like as much punch or. Uh, do you use a lot of pedals or do you just bring it into your DAW and then work with it? For li if it's live bass, you mean? Or yeah. Or yeah. If you're bringing in a live bass, for example. If it's live bass, no, I just go, I just play it DI. I have a really nice audio interface. It's a great river. And the DI sound, or not audio interface, I'm sorry, I totally misspoke. Microphone preamp. <laughs> uh, I have the great river. MP2NV preamp and the DI on it is awesome. So, and it's a good bass. So, so I just record it straight in and often it's just a great bass tone and I don't even do much to it to mix. Although, um, I do have, I kind of more recently got into the universal audio game of their plugins and that's my interface is an Apollo X8. So, there's some really good bass. Um, base amp modeling plugins that that also just kind of take it to another level if you want that sound. Now, when you are refining a track, what sounds or what aspects do you try and bring in and or leave out? So, what do you what are you thinking about when you're kind of refining the final mix? So I, I always have, excuse me, a few things that I guess the same kinds of things are always my last 5% of how do I bring this track home. By the way, um, I personally love to create in um, session view in Ableton. And I urge anybody who's making music in Ableton who only makes music in arrangement view to get out of that traditional, I record from left to right and build my song mindset and use session view because it's, it's a unique workflow to Ableton. No other DAW lets you create and work in that way. And it's one of the things that's so powerful and magical about Ableton Live. So I'll make like, I'll always come up with, you know, 70 to 80 five percent of my track idea and and arrangement everything is in session view and then i get it over and then of course you have to put it to arrangement view and finish the track um for me the thing that always comes last and you'd be amazed how much these little things make the world of difference is adding crash hits to those certain spots in the song where you need to really emphasize like boom chorus has happening or whatever and those parts where you just take the crash and reverse it and like do those sh you know to make it feel cool when you're ending other sections and so all you like place those at the end and it's just sound the track sounds so much more done just doing that as long as you have a crash you know that sounds good and I like to do ear candies like anywhere in the song. It's a little boring needs something interesting. So whether it's, let me just grab this one sound and delay it off. So now you, you get to if, for four bars here, like a cool delay trail or where are the parts I'm going to automate ascend and return to like delay something off or have like a bit a reverb or like those, those kind of moments 
maybe take one little thing and, and um, manually copy and paste it and make it do a stutter or a chop. So you just fill in those little ear candy moments where it needs it. And then if there's somewhere in the track that feels like it needs more dynamically, like the production could be bigger here. Um, it's, it's, you could almost never go wrong throwing an arpeggiated pattern of a cool synth line doing an arpeggio over it. So um, it's, it's, you know, kind of like the joke in that Portland, that old Portlandia thing. I don't know if you've seen it where it's like, put a bird on it, just put a bird on it, put a bird on it. I don't know if you've seen that. No, I haven't. You know what I'm talking about. For anyone who does, for anyone who does, <laughs> somebody does it's that. like, put an arpeggio on it. Just put an arpeggio on it. Is your song done yet? Put an arpeggio on it. Um, so those, those are uh, something I like to always go to. Nice. They're just really interesting and they add movement. And I also like one of my classic nine theory things I do is, uh, usually the end of a song, like the last chorus, you know, you want the dynamics, the biggest they've been yet. So I'll just add, um, I'll add a pad that's playing the chords to that. That's a really buzzy, like just like a straight up saw wave. Like whatever, if you open up Serum, just the default just saw wave. Cut right through. And I just auto filter that to slowly open up. So you get this movement and building and it only sounds like an intense saw at the very last second. And then it's- When you say you know, auto drops. filter, what, will you explain that a little bit? So auto filter is an Ableton native device, but it's just basically meaning I filter the pad so that um, I do what's called a low pass or I cut all the highs out and slowly open it up. So you're hearing more and more highs and more and more highs and more and more highs. And what's cool about doing that with something with a lot of, a lot of harmonic content, like a saw wave, it's all buzzy and just, uh, is that there's a lot of room as you sweep through it for the sound to really evolve and change and open up. So you don't even notice it happening until the end. You're like, why is this getting bigger? And why is this epic? And that's like a go-to thing I do to bring a track home if it needs it. And, and then also besides adding crashes, where are the little moments that are cool to like mute the drums out, which is very hip hop, right? Just take like right for here. a bar just, or two. Just uh, silence for, for a half measure or a bar or just a beat and it comes back in. Th those kinds of little games make, make your track more interesting. That's great. Those are a lot of excellent tips. I appreciate you sharing. Yeah. So some of the secret sauce. <laughs> of course. So how do you avoid putting too much into a song or over baking it? It's a good question. Less is more in music for sure. I really believe that less is more, but sometimes you want a lot going on especially in electronic music or if you're building dynamics and really want something intense and epic. I don't have a philosophy on it. I just keep adding stuff until it feels done. You know, I could add something and then what else would be cool to add to it? And this is rad and what else? And then at some point you, you realize it sounds awesome and you don't need to add more. Or if you do, it could be ridiculous. You know, I, I guess, um, what was it? I, was it the most recent EP me and Emancipator made, A Thousand Clouds? That song, Pharaoh Dunes, which might be my favorite song on it. At the end, there's so much shit going on. And I had to definitely strip back. <laughs> I was I was bringing that home as the final mixing, so... Um, muting things. There's a couple other songs that me and him did together where we throw so many ideas at something and they're all cool and they can't all happen. You like have to pick a few and you definitely have to leave some out. It's just too much shit. So if it's becoming just a clusterfuck and it's like impossible to mix, you just too much going on. I feel like you just know, like for me, I listen to the music as I work on it and I just know, especially when I'm not in the studio, but if I like, listen to it while I'm driving around, not in the studio. So I'm kind of just passively listening, although I'm analyzing it. It's very obvious to me, like this part is boring. This needs something else. 
this part's great. It doesn't need anything else, you know? Yeah. And I, I do think it's important to get away from the environment or take a break from the song. So you're not listening to the same 16 bar loop for five hours or something. Yeah. It's, it's cool as long as you're still vibing it, but as soon as it starts feeling a little monotonous, you know, take a break for sure. So let's dive into some of your collaborations before we dive into some of your original works. You, you mentioned that album with Emancipator. How is it that you're able to create such a, a fruitful collaboration where it's not just a track or a remix, it's a full EP? I don't know, man. We just kind of hit some magic together. Um, Emancipator's name is Doug. Him and I have been friends for a long time. We met in 2011 or 2012 at Regeneration Festival. At the time I was in my Inspired Flight project, which is me and my friend Eric, and which is completely what like turned into Nine Theory. Sonically, it's very similar. Nine Theory is just me solo. Um, but Inspired Flight was playing at the same festival, met, met Emancipator. Uh, and so when, when a few years back, I went to Portland to, to create with Doug, um, I kind of went there on a music making thing. I, there were, I had a numerous friends in the area I wanted to link up with and just like collaborate for fun. And Doug was one of them. And that first song we made, it was Chameleon, the track one on our Chiba Gold EP. And we just did that in a, one day. And, uh, and it was cool. And, and I, we were both were pretty stoked on it. So I asked him, what should we do with this? Like, do you want to just put it out as a single or do you want to make more and make an EP? And he's like, let's make an EP. So I flew back, like, I think just like two weeks later or three weeks later, like as soon as I could, I got back up there. And, and what we did with that and the following EP was basically marathon sessions where we would start a new morning with nothing and by, and just come up with something from scratch. And just by the end of that night, it was done. It was almost mixed. The whole shit was like practically done. And it was intense, you know, like talk about exhaustion <laughs> the end of those nights, just like, oh my God, but so rewarding and feeling so stoked on, on, on what you're making and how productive you're being. But yeah, we tore through those. So each song was essentially like one day and um, finalizing the mixing later. And we just, that's what we made and, and stay true to it. We also each EP, the order of the songs is the order they were made. Oh, that's it's interesting. It's kind of like, here's what we did when we got together, like listen to it. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great. Well, I, I think it's rare that artists are able to collaborate in such a way that they're able to create a full body of work, not just a piece or a remix of somebody else's. So that's awesome that you're able to do that and to be able to incorporate your own ideas, but also listen and you yeah. know, take feedback. And obviously that goes for both parties. So that's, we just work well awesome. together. We, we, we have fun hanging out. We trust each other, which is the most important thing in collaboration. And, and so the result is great. You know, it's something different than what I just make or what he just makes, and which is usually how collaboration works, which is the beauty of it. It's usually something a little different that's cooler. I, I feel like when any two people collaborate and uh, as long as the vibe is good, you know. Um, but yeah, we, we both, we, we both, can produce and play music and work our way around Ableton and editing and mixing. So it's constantly like trading roles and back and forth. And just, that's how we could get things done so fast, but it's just cause the vibes, right. And, and we would go into it, not trying to make like a dope EP for people. It was like, let's just collaborate for fun for ourselves. And that was the focus. That's what we did. And then at the end we're like, well, let's put it out. Nice. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, it's so, so rewarding to have a session like that and you feel like you've come up with something that's worth sharing and that should get out there. 
It's so cool. One of my favorite memories ever making music is that the day or the, you know, the day we made the song Quika, which would have to be my favorite song off our Chiba Gold EP. when it was like the end of the night and it's basically like the finished version and we started that day with nothing right like had no idea what the fuck Quika, like that that would even happen like listening back to it all loud to just like we're done let's listen back and just like dance to it i mean the the this feeling that was like the best fucking feeling like we were so stoked on that track <laughs> we like danced to it and then we were like fuck Let's play it again. And we like dance to it one more time. <laughs> Just like as if we were at a music festival. Yeah. It was awesome. That's great. Well, you earned it. It's, it's, that's the rewarding dance. Fuck yeah. Going back to one of your older tracks, the piece that fits. a story behind it how how did that one come to be it's hard to remember how that one started but i love that song that's one of my favorite songs i made because it very much for me embodies radiohead vibes which are radiohead is was one of my favorite bands ever like besides the beatles radiohead would be the other most amazing band that i really is an influence so I tried, you know, it's kind of whenever possible. It's like, how can I sound like Radiohead? That song is very Radioheadish to me. Um, it's just such a mood, you know. I, I I probably started it with some samples and just building the whole vibe and and coming up with those row. It's, it's kind of like an A minor, but the roads goes D silent, so it feels like it goes D. To a d a and then the c a i don't know there's something about that it's just was such a vibe and then what really made that song cooler was um so Ilya is the violinist with emancipator and he played all the violins on that which i just sent it to him and he tracked and sent it back but he all those strings are like so epic like he really made that song dope and then my friend kelsey ray little who plays harp like a classical harp right harp she is all over my first album. There's a lot of harp. It's all my friend I recorded there in Encinitas. So she's adding harp and it's amazing. And, uh, you know, that's what I do a lot is, is I like to have other people who are good at what they do add to my Ninth Theory music. Part of why Ninth Theory stuff sounds cool is whatever I do with something, then I'll send it off to other people or have come, people come record and and who play stuff I don't for the organic real instruments and stuff. And then of course, kill a priest rapping on it is like ridiculous. I think it's so important to collaborate and bring in the other ideas and, and know that somebody else might be able to make it better. 
So it's, it's certainly worth a try. How do you deal with situations where other people are wanting you to remix or work on their work? Or if you send something out to somebody, maybe they send it back. It's just doesn't, doesn't fit. Uh, have you ever had those situations where you have to kind of send a collaboration to the, to the bin? Uh, not really, not really luckily. So as far as remixes, so I don't know, there are not, I feel like there's a few things you asked me. Are you talking about when someone wants me to remix them? Yes. And, or yeah, but let's just do that. So that every now and then I will be inspired enough by something that I will hit someone up and offer and ask if I can remix them for free. Um, but, and, and then of course, starting out, that was what you always do. But now I just, I don't have time to do free remixes. Um, but every now and then something's inspiring enough. That's what's cool about it. It's like, oh my God, can I remix this? I want to do this. Um, but usually people hit me up about it or I have plenty of producer friends who it's all it's just kind of on trade. Like, yo, you want to remix this for my, my new album? It's like, hell yeah, I'll remix that. And kept, you could do a remix for me someday down the line or whatever. Yeah. It tends to be how that works. Um, as far as collaborating with, um, you know, the, the MCs who rap on my stuff, or people, you know, usually people who play instruments come over and I record them. So it's, it's, I'm capturing what I want or need. Um, so I'm t definitely getting what I will want to use. But there have been like two times, I think, where an MC has sent something that was just a little too off topic for what the song meant to me. And I did have to, um, you know, very diplomatically give feedback and, and ask them to rewrite their rap um here's the, actually what the song is more about you kind of hit that theme better and then and, and they've been cool enough to do it and then nailed it you know but that's great that's that's happened it's it's yeah it's, it's, it's a delicate process yeah, two artists to, yeah. trying to make <laughs> one piece of cohesive art so that's yeah but see there's it's different collaborating in a true collaboration is different than being a producer, finding people to help you make your music. Yeah, that's a good point. That's because different. you know what you're looking for. It's like, here's what I'm doing. I want you involved, but it has to be what I want with what I'm doing. That's different than a collaboration. Collaboration is, you know, open to whatever. And you wouldn't say, hey, can you write a different rap? It's, you know what I mean? Yeah. Not in the same way. Yeah. So you've released a few tracks more recently. One, just a piece that you also released the instrumental. My pain has a name and that name matches mine. Matches but yet mine. I play the game like there's no one else inside. No else inside. The brain that plays tricks and lays bricks around my pride. Around my it's pride. To me and my homeboy telling me there's nowhere left to hide left to The hide. thorn in my side is the thought of not arriving Surviving off the old me, that's not my way to rise Prefer my stakes on high, when I play my part, I take my time Yet I grind so tough for the piece of planet I occupy I burn so hot, your chemistry changes life Indirect, my sect is not to be denied Upon request, the test is given for the drive Across the landscape, a man takes in thoughts And derived from the talent given to me by the heavens and it's mine I'm a selfish music lover, writer, menace and a tribe Leader, feeder of a prime target Which is shining past the planets And reminding you to stand it full attention when I ride Fire's gonna burn Here we go You're done with another turn Don't you know be somebody else Foaming at the mouth to be So talk to me a little bit about that Why and how did that track come to be? So that's oh, so the piece that fits that we just spoke about is on my first Nine Theory album called Against the Odds of Entropy. It came out uh, 2015, basically at the very beginning of the year. Um, so just a piece is also from that album, which is maybe my favorite song on that album. Just a piece is very 
interesting to me. Like musically, it's really trippy, the theory and like what's going on and the different vibes and flavors. So even though that album came out a while ago, at the time, I also had all the instrumental versions mastered, but for some reason I just have sat on them. And I just recently founded my own record label, Shoto Records. And How so, do you spell that for anybody out there? S H O D O. And it's it's um it's it's just me. It's a way to put my music out, you know, um, through a more proper like uh, music distributor ch channel than like a distro kit or a CD baby. Uh, and I thought I was creating it to put my new upcoming third album out, but then it turns out I, I'm going to put that out with a different label, but I still have Shoto Records. So I was like, well, I have to put something out and dope. I've always wanted to put the instrumentals out to my first record. So that's why only now are they coming out. So just a piece, <coughs> excuse me, just a piece instrumental version just came out last Friday or something. Um, Next Friday, another one's coming out. And at the end of October on the 29th, the whole instrumental album will come out. Um, but it's cool to remind people about it. Like, hey, remember this old album of mine? Like, here's the instrumentals. That's why they're coming out. Like, Just a Piece came out as a two-song single with the, the vocal version also as track two. So people can remember and check it out. That song... Um, I think I found a cool drum break. And then I had, uh, that was one of those happy accidents where I was just looking through samples and had this folder bass. And, and there were two bass samples. And the first one was one note. Boom. The second, and then I hit the down arrow. What's the second one sound like? Boom. It was just a half step lower. And I was like, that shit sounds so cool. It's literally how the song starts. It's what you hear. Those two bass notes were just two different samples of one bass note that were half step apart. And it was the vibe. So <laughs> it's like, then it was just off and running at that point. You know, what else do I do to make this cool? That's awesome. Yeah. So how do you organize your samples? What are you creating? Are you creating them? Are those like organic samples that you made or are those like splice? So I, I didn't even know what splice was until recently. So nothing of mine that is out now has splice stuff on it. But my third album, I have to admit that's coming out at the beginning of next year. There's a number of splice things on there even more heavily than like I will do in the future because I was ex new to it and like, oh, this is shit's all cool. And, and certain things ex inspired songs that I really love that are like on the record. But um, what I do is, you, it's, it's very important to have a sample library, right? Anyone in Ableton, I recommend having one folder that's called like my sample library or whatever. And then you just add that folder to Ableton's browser and then anything that samples you collect for the rest of your life, just add it to that one folder and you just click on it and then there it all is, right? How do That's you organize do. it? Because then so, it's going to be chaos in that folder. Well, uh, well it's not chaos. Time. It's my sample library. It's everything I, I have is sample, is my, my whole sample library. So it's in alphabetical order and you just have to, which comes from using it, you memorize, you just learn what's in what. Like, oh, I want a, I want like a really cool ride sound. I know if I go and jazz drums, right, I have some sick rides and crashes for in my jazz drums folder. I want, I want that alchemist hip hop snare. That's in my folder from Julian samples that my friend Julian gave me. And I know, and there's the alchemist. You just, I don't know, like you do it enough and I know where things are. So you got a bunch crazy. of subfolders and oh, categorize it. Oh, it's like a shitload it. of folders. And then yeah. you open one and it has like four folders and each one of those is 10 yeah. folders. Like it's ridiculous. Yeah. And, and then, you know, a lot, most of it sucks. Like you, you get samples and it's like snare and there's sometimes there's literally like 400 snares and most of them suck and there's like four good ones. So it, it's, it can be daunting, but um, what, what, what I makes love, a great snare? Though, okay. Yeah. Keep oh, what makes you, that, that's, that's not even, depends what genre you're going okay. for. All right. Uh, so anyway. What, do what I do that I, what I do that I I haven't seen anyone else do, but I'm telling you all, this is the move of all moves. 
is to make a folder in your in your um, sample folder. For me, it's called Splice Best, or you can name it whatever. But it's like because Splice is an amazing tool, and not just to, I'm not saying like let me sample like full on chord progressions, but just to collect incredible one shot drum hits. So like you could find a bunch of rad kicks for hip hop, for house music, for techno, s different snares, different kinds of like ride, all of those things you need to build beats. They're high quality, right? But you can go through and only download things you love that you will fuck with. So so anything in Splice I've downloaded is is curated. It's like these are this is stuff inspiring to me or that I know will sound good stuff I will use. So what the move is, is to make a folder and then inside of that splice folder, you have to open splice desktop app that pops up and go to like downloads, show all downloads. And if you've never done this, this is going to be the gnarliest thing. It'll take you hours um, to get caught up, but you just go through and play each thing you've ever downloaded. And like, this is a snare make a folder called snare, drag it in it. This is a horn, make a folder called horns. Boom. This is a, uh, this is vocals. This is a kick. So it, I could show you, I'm looking at Ableton right now inside of my splice best folder. I have taken everything I've ever downloaded and put it into in Ableton. I just open it up and it's like, what do I want? Bass, breaks, claps, cymbals, downlifters, dubstep, dusty hip hop, electric pianos, fills, flute, effects, guitar, harp, hats. I can go on and on and on. Like it, if it's unique enough, I just give it its own new folder. Risers, snaps, soundscapes, stomps, things to sample and chop up, toms, womps, wubs you know what i mean yeah, so no, that's great because no, that's the that's the key though is being organized to be able to find what you're looking for splice is a nightmare otherwise how would you ever know what you're trying to find and if you actually just go um you know anything you download on splice it's in the desktop app but it also does live somewhere in a folder but each folder is named by like whoever made it with like the craziest names of like ddh underscore lsf slash yeah. number 85 this you know it's like you don't know what you're you don't know what that snare is like so so now whenever like last night i just I felt like i needed inspiration i downloaded a bunch of new stuff from splice mostly just one shot drums and things but as you go you find other things that are inspiring so uh i just one by one dragged them all in to their folders and now it's like it's in my sample library in ableton boom that's the move yeah, that has helped me so much to to organize splice like that. Well, that's the the daily grind or effort that's required to be ahead and ready to when you're inspired. You're looking for womps. You know what folder to go to. You know, or, dude, I know exactly. And, and they're only really good period. ones that I like. Yeah. That's why I downloaded them. <laughs> that's great. And doesn't matter what note the womp is. Like I could just turn it into any note I want in Ableton. Yeah, for and. Oh, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say versus for anybody out there listening, like if you didn't do that homework or the prep work, you want to want, now what do you got to do? You got to go Google splice. You got to go, you have to go find to it, and drag internet, it in. Yeah. And then suddenly you're on Facebook, you're watching ads, you know, like different things happen. The internet's going to distract you. So it's important to be able to stay in, in your tool set and find Being what organized you're yeah. is, is a really important thing as a music producer. If you're really serious about this, be organized like do not be someone who just makes every tr beat you ever make in ableton is called track audio one audio two three audio four audio five audio six audio seven audio eight audio that's that's amateur hour like don't do that if you're gonna lay down if it's like a bass name that shit bass <laughs> you know and color code your tracks that's even more the pro move you know, whatever makes sense for you. I could open any session I've ever made and just looking at it, these are all purple drums, the dark purple, that's my kick, this is my crash, that's my ride. Yellow is bass, reds are electric guitars, orange is like organic acoustic guitar, sub bass is mustard yellow. It's like, I have my own method. Vocals are always this color, harmonies are this. It's like, it just makes it so much easier. And um, I think 
a lot of producers will say this. This is so important, especially if you're newer to the game. Is, is you don't always feel inspired to make music, but if you want to be like working towards being productive and growing as a producer, take those times you don't feel like making music and have those still be, I'm going to sit down for a few hours and I'm going to organize my shit. I'm going to go on Splice. I'm going to get new inspiring samples. I'm going to put them in folders and name them. I'm going to make a custom drum rack of like, this folder has a hundred kicks. I'm going to just find my favorite like 10 and like put them in a drum rack and call it, you know, whatever dusty drums kicks or whatever it was. And just be hella organized with your shit. And, and then when you do that work and then when you are in the mood to create, you just have all these tools ready. Just like you're going to make epic shit. You're ready to go. Like you're setting yourself up for um, success later. So it's important to make time to do that tedious organization stuff that's separate from the creation times. Yeah, well said. And it'll help you stay in the flow once you are in that creation space you're not going to be, you don't have to use the internet in theory. Yeah. Just yeah. Who, turn wants off to, who, wants to, who wants to jump online while you're trying and making a track? Yeah. So there's a few other songs that stood out for me. One that's called Beaches that I'd like to talk nice. about. song first of all there's some lyrics in it whose voice is it that's me so i'm okay. i'm always the male vocalist on nine theory music except for the song island song um which is also on that second album of mine with beaches it's called good morning from a nuclear ghost so track one on that was a collaboration with my friend um julian temple and he's singing Otherwise, I'm always the male vocalist on any Nine Theory stuff. Tell me about the lyrics behind Beaches. It sounds like it's kind of like you're longing for the ocean or something, but t tell me uh, about it. Yeah, that was me just catching a vibe. It's not necessarily about anything specific, but it's this it's this kind of vision of, a, of almost a movie scene. It's like... I don't color in the lines. I just thought that sounded cool. It's like, I don't play by the rules necessarily. I'm just kind of, it's kind of just a statement of, well, you can mean whatever you want it to mean. Just thought it sounded rad. It's like, I, I march to the beat of my own drum. Uh, I breathe the city through an open window. So I'm picturing like someone living in an apartment in New York City or something. They're like kind of higher up, just like at night, kind of a uh, feeling of longing, looking out of the window and um you know i grind my heart out for the lights it's like you know to live here and be in the city it's like i work my ass off all i do is grind just to be here in the city it's like fuck all i need is beaches like i need to like i need to get away that's what it's about like what i really need is to uh, you know connect with nature and i'm just here in the city looking out the window grinding all day every day and then the verse two is, you know, I forget exactly how it goes. It just keeps playing up on that. Um, so, so you put yourself into the perspective of somebody else in a city. It wasn't about a personal experience. No, it wasn't personal. That's what's cool about songwriting. It doesn't have to be. You could totally play characters. And a lot of times, this song isn't that, but you could play characters. The characters are people you know. So, so stuff people that are friends of mine or family, like people I love or care about, things they go through. I could just write a song as first person as if I went through, but it's there's other people's stories too. You know, you can do that as a songwriter. And when you're writing 
for I guess just to use an example, this track, do you start with the lyrics? Do you start with the melody? Do you build the always a melody? Okay, so you build the structure of the song, and then lyrics kind of come after. I'm so melody oriented. Melody for me, excuse me, writing melodies is like one of my X Men powers. It's again, it's just being so obsessed with the Beatles. Like I can't even explain to you how much I soaked them up, like a sponge, and tr and how much I've written songs since I was 15. And if you're into the Beatles, it's like melodies, everything, right? So, so melody is easy for me. Lyrics can take me a long time. Like I, I, I write songs sometimes and the lyrics come years later, like seriously. Or even if I'm like, cool, I want to finish this. I want to write m lyrics and have this, record this right now. Like it might take me days or a couple weeks till the lyrics are right and good enough where I love every line or I found like, what is this even about? It's like, um, I often come up with my lyrics um, when I'm going through a jog in the neighborhood. That's like my meditative, like I'm on a run, like thinking like what, coming up with it. <laughs> nice. So you, lyrics are challenging for me. I, I ultimately come up with lyrics I like, but it's, it's like, yeah, those are definitely harder for me. Do you just like uh, use your audio recorder on your phone or something, snap down your ideas? Yeah. To, out of to, breath yeah job. like i come back from a run it's like okay i need to not forget you know i used it used to be cool where you would write stuff down and now it's like i write it down in my phone as a note <laughs> yeah i still have a songwriting you know like the, like a journal but um it gets neglected for the fucking iPhone. But yeah, so it's just a note in my phone so I don't remember. And like I'll have different ideas where I'll, if I have two different ideas for one line, I'll always put that line in parentheses and have the lyric, then a slash, what the other option is, and then the other parentheses. So I know like this is two options for this line. And ultimately it like narrows down to I find, I find it. Nice. And w what, how do you know you found it? Like, do you just, do you start singing it and- I like it. You feel it? Because nothing bothers it. me. Okay. I think it's cool. If, as long as I think it's cool and it's, and it's makes sense for what I'm trying to have the song be about and it sounds cool song, how it should be, then, then I'm done. Uh, I, it's, I definitely know when a lyric still bothers me. Like yeah. this is lame, or this could be cool, or this is cheesy. Like this is fucking dumb, or you know, this isn't as good as it can be. I want it. Uh, it's chasing the dragon. <laughs> yeah. What were some of the big core lessons, if you could summarize it, that you feel like you learned from studying the Beatles and or songwriting for as long as you have been? Maybe thinking about it structurally versus you know how how you lay out the song over the timeline. Maybe there's other insights that you've had. No, it's like, I think my biggest takeaway songwriting wise, it's, it's not like a structure thing. I mean, you could have the classic, like early Beatles is great for like, here's pop songwriting structure. And that always works. But later Beatles and a lot of Radiohead stuff is like totally not that. And that's why it's cool. So I think for me, my biggest takeaway that I, that I, I would think about when I was newer to songwriting and never, it's still good to remind myself now and then, although it's just kind of what I always do now it, it, it's cool to, to try to do something unexpected. And this is especially true. If you're newer to songwriting, if, if you're new to songwriting, here's what you absolutely hundred percent will do. And maybe if you're not so new, you will do what everyone else will do. Like there's a, you know, that there's rules to music and what's called like the diatonic chords in a key is what most music is written following these certain rules of these three chords are major and these three are minor. And, and here's how different ways to put them together. And so we've all heard music our whole lives since we're babies, right? Like we're, we're exposed to it. So there's this like, expectation and especially when you're newer and you're like coming up with chords if you have this chord to this chord let's say you go c to g you probably want to go to like f next or something one five four progression or 
whatever else you think might come next is is probably what most people would also think should sound cool to go to next. And even more so, what melody do you write if you go from C to G to F, right? There's a very obvious melody lines or ways to connect notes and move from chord to chord. So I was aware that like, okay, whatever I'm going to start singing over this is probably what most people's brains would think should be like what's sung over it when I go to the next chords. Like I'm, I'm going to on purpose come up with something as wildly different than my first instinct. That's the game I was playing with myself is like, if, if it feels like you should go to this chord and melody next, don't. Or go to, you know, if the melody's like da 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 da, and it's like da da sounds obvious. Uh, maybe I'm going to go da 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 da, and like go somewhere way else and do something different. Always like challenging myself, like it's a game as I'm writing. To you know, like I said, once you're more seasoned, I, I just I don't like remind myself that anymore. But when I was younger and really into songwriting, I, I definitely was reminding myself like that that thing like i'm gonna do what like 98 percent of people would do so let me like totally do something different that is such a unique mindset that i've heard of think realizing that you are prone to be the average or you know to to go the you're prone you're prone to do like the the same shit you've heard before yeah yeah that's why pop music all sounds the same still as it always has it's because it's like you're gonna it's like write that same melody that's catchy it's like well it's been done like do something out there because the beatles are constantly doing the most unique creative melodic shit you're like what you know over interesting chord changes so that's the other thing is like instead of going from c to g to f what if i go from c to g to like f minor or e major like some wild shit like you would not see coming and here's the other thing not only will that help you as a songwriter but what makes people like music doesn't even matter the genre is whenever you deliver an unexpected result to them. So it could be as simple as like, if I go C G F, that's what everyone's heard their whole life. And if I go C G minor F, it's like, that's, that's, that's a unexpected, like, Whoa, delivering that five chord is a minor. And people who hear it will have no idea what you did or why it's different, but they'll be like, that's different. Ooh, what was that? That's cool. Same with production. If it's like, this is my drum programming beat. Instead of looping a one bar pattern, make it like two bars. And every second bar, there's one little thing, but then double that. So it's actually four bars because every fourth bar, there's one extra little kick. And it's like, once someone notices that, it's like, oh shit. Or you expect it to be the same and then there's a difference. Like you you set up expectations and then you deliver something else and people go, ooh, that was a cool moment. That's almost always how it's received. Like that was fucking cool. I like that. Yeah, when you're talking about the notes and hearing where it should go or where it's expected to go and then veering off somewhere different, and you mentioned how as a listener, you get kind of delight by the surprise. Uh, Mm -hmm. I think you're you're, you're nailing it because I I experience that when I'm listening to music, it's particularly jazz or classical in the car because I... tend to not plug in my phone. So I just listen to the like old school radio waves, but uh, jazz or classical and they, and they tend to, I hear something and I expect it to repeat, but it doesn't, or it, it just takes a left turn all of a sudden. And it's really enjoyable when the music evolves in an unexpected way. It's like you, as a producer, you should play a game where, where you, um, you're intentionally setting up an expectation just to not deliver it. It could I, be I something, seen, yeah. Yeah, it could be as simple as like the next track you make. Just have like a like a two bar pattern. It could be like you know whatever. Did it bum bum And what does everyone think is going to happen again? Da da da. But you're going to think it's going to be what you just heard. So the second time it could go. 
da 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 ba da 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 ba 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 and like go to some fucking horns ba 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 ba. It's like what was that? And then it goes right back into it da da da. And I'm just making shit up right now. But of course, yeah. like that moment will be like, oh damn. But you can't have that have happened the first time. It's like you set it up and then you think you're gonna hear the same shit again and it does something else. And you're like, that was cool. Whenever you deliver something different than the expectation, you said it perfect. It's a delight for the, that moment is like delightful for the listener. Yeah, it makes, when you were talking, it makes me think of a muse, uh, sorry, a magician who would, you know, yeah. look at this hand, look at this hand. And then suddenly they do something else with the other hand. You know? Totally. That's a great analogy. But you have to set it up with the, the pre in order to pull off the trick or the delight or the surprise. So sometimes, a lot of times we do this without th meaning to, but if you're aware of it and you kind of think about it as you're doing it so that you're like intentionally doing it, you can come up with some really cool stuff because I'm just telling you like the, the payoff works. Like, like pe that's uh, the genre is irrelevant. Like that is cool. It makes people like music better whenever their subconscious even expectations have something else happen. It's like a, you're playing a game with people's brains. Whether they know it or not, their brain likes the game. Yeah, that's well and said. And that's like one of the cool things about, about music production. What advice would you give to a young musician starting out today? Do this shit as much as possible. Well, it depends what you want to do. If you want to like play violin, practice four hours a day if not more if you want to like get good at making beats like make 400 beats like do it like uh, showing up there there's no shortcut to getting better if something you want to do than clocking hours right and it's literally an hours game. It's and and, and I like to th think about it's the snow like snowboarding. Like I like snowboarding. I could tell someone I've been snowboarding for fifteen years, but I'm not as good as someone who's been snowboarding for five months, maybe because in fifteen years I might go once every four years. Right? It's not like how long have I been doing it. It's like how many hours have I done it? If I only go once every four seasons, one day, and someone else is like, I want to learn snowboarding, and they've been doing it five months, and they snowboard every day, they're going to be like way better at snowboarding than me, even though I've been doing it 15 years, right? It's like how many hours are you doing it? Just make music. Don't judge yourself at all at first when you're new yeah your shit's gonna might suck or it definitely won't be as good as you want it to be but as long as you're making something you think is cool then cool and, and for anyone any stage it should be all about having fun and it should be all about making cool music that's it like i've always had this mantra for myself it's all about me it's all about the music and it's all about having fun nothing more nothing less as soon as you get caught up in any bullshit beyond that, you're losing the plot. If, if it's not about just how cool can I make this music and am I having fun? If it's like, can I get booked on this tour or be these shows or I, I want to play this festival or can I, I need to get bigger? Or I, I need more people liking me or like more monthly listeners. Like you've lost the plot. Yeah, of course all that would be cool, but that's like not why you should be fucking doing it. You should do it because it's fun. Because you're just really, it's a relationship between you and the music and you're trying to make the music as cool as you can. And just, it's all about the making music you like. And, and if you, if you just stick with that mentality, uh, you, you'll, you'll be good, man. You'll be good to go and just, you'll get better and better and better and better. And it'll be even more and more fun. And all of the other things might just start happening. You know, but you have to just just stay focused on why you're doing it, and, and don't. It's so much easier to say this than do it. But don't compare yourself to to other people's journeys around you because that's always a losing game. No matter how much you're crushing it, you could always feel bummed because you're not as good as or you're not as big as this person, or you didn't get this opportunity like this person. It's like whatever, dude. You don't know that person. You don't know the shit behind the scenes they've been through to get there, or maybe they're crushing it and they're a miserable person. Like, fuck that. Why would you want that? Like, that's not cool. It's like, you know, it's, it's all about being happy. 
And, and I would say also, I know I'm blabbing about this, but um, like I had to do a lot of self work when things weren't working out for me as much as I wanted them to, to realize like my measure of success is a hundred percent up to me to be whatever I want that to be. Easier said than done, but again, to not be like, I'm only successful if I have this many people listening to me on SoundCloud or Spotify or liking this shit, because that's what all these other people and peers and friends or artists I look up to, that they're all have that happening. Like, why the fuck aren't I? And so you get bummed if you care about that. But if you just focus on the fact that you do it because you love it, and every time I make music, as long as I make it to the best of my ability and I'm proud of it, then I'm successful. What else like it? What else? Any, any other measurement of success is, is ridiculous. I'm crushing it. As long as every time I make shit, I'm proud of it. And it's the best I could do at that point in time. That's then I'm, then that's good. And, and everything else will come as it may. And, and, and I will also say this, just remember if you're a producer trying to be an artist, the only thing you can absolutely control in this entire industry is the music, the art you make. Everything else is out of your hands. No matter how much money you spend on PR, marketing, no matter how much you get like a fuck off team around you, it's all out of your hands, all the other stuff that happens. Like the only thing you can control is like making your music. So just do the best you can and don't, be attached to the rest of it because you can't control it. I'd say that's good advice. Yeah, yeah, well said. You touched on a lot of different points. I appreciate a lot of them. One, to just riff off of your snowboarding analogy, putting in the time is very important. But I would also say that you need to move off of the bunny hill eventually. You know, like if you just, if you're just lapping the green runs year after year, you're not going to get a become a good snowboarder. That's so true. You need to push yourself, pick up that new instrument, try and explore that new chord progression that you have never touched and you know, pushing or into study, the unknown. study some music theory. I will say this too, just to throw this out there for anyone who might be listening to this who makes music. No matter how dope you are at making music right now, if you don't have a solid understanding of music theory, you're not as dope as you possibly full potential could be that's what's interesting about music is like you don't have to know what you're doing at all you could still make really good music if you have a good ear but if you learn what's how it works so that that's an asset and you will be even better for it so so learn it and if, if it's, I know it could be really daunting and hard, like hit me up. I could give you Zoom lessons and I'm good at teaching theory. So like anyone can understand it, but it's important to learn it however you, however you need to. I think it's, it's super useful. Nice. And when did you learn to read music? I don't know how to read music very well, but I know music theory. They're different. Okay, fair. In fact, learning to, yeah, learning music theory, learning music theory and context of reading music and writing it is a clusterfuck because most people don't need to learn to read and write, and you're learning that at the same time. It's like crazy. Um, you don't ever need to learn that unless you you want to be like a session player or or really get into like a career. Like I'm in a class, I'm in an orchestra, or I want to score for film and stuff. Otherwise, you don't need to know how to do that. I, I know how to read music, but uh, it's like clumsy. I can't sight read and play guitar. I'd be like, what is, you know, take me a while. But that's so totally different than theory. Yeah, well, I appreciate you differentiating those because in my mind, they're kind of wrapped up. So help me understand what is theory and what maybe some of the best sources other than hitting you up for Zoom lessons if somebody's listening. <laughs> I don't know because I don't know what good sources are because okay. the way I see it taught everywhere else is like makes it kind of confusing. Uh, I mean, there's something called musictheory.net, I think. They have all these ear trainers and uh, dude, there's stuff I'm forgetting right now. There's even more recent resources that have great online to like help you, but still it's like, um, it's not the same as a person explaining it to you or showing it to you, so I think. Did you take theory lessons? 
Or was that uh, from your no, father? No, my, my dad taught me, okay. and then I got better at it. And I, I, I took some violin and guitar from this one guy named Speedy Beers once, and he kind of hipped me to more. And then I learned more from other people. And as I became a teacher, I learned more. And I'm still learning, you know, theories can get deep. It's crazy. But um, to understand just the basics of how music works, essentially like to understand how to build major and minor scales and how to make chords out of those and what chords go together and why, and why, you know, there, there's like how it works, but then there's the, there's the way of applying it. Like, so you on purpose know if I go from this chord to this chord, it's this emotion. And that's, what's cool. Like if you make music, you're actually like an alchemist. Like we are, we are turning sound waves into emotional experiences. That's what's crazy about making music. So if you, if you do that, if you know the theory, you can actually intentionally orchestrate how you want someone to feel. Cause you know, if I go to like in a major key, the three chord in any chord change has a unique emotional stamp. And you learned and like hear it on the radio and be like, they just went from the one to the three major to the four minor. Like I can tell because it feels a way. Everything has a feeling, an emotion that human beings experience. So, so why not learn how to like masterfully use that when you're making music, you know? I, I just, so many people like are like, oh, music's my life. And they like don't know shit about how it works. <laughs> it's like, you don't want to learn the language? Like, come on, <laughs> learn it. It'll help you. You don't need it, but it'll help. That's great. I think uh, I think you just made a great case for why every musician out there should be learning theory. I think they should, but but again, you could still be super good at music without knowing it. So it's like you have to. For anybody listening out there who wants to connect, maybe somebody who wants to take you up on those theory lessons or wants to reach out another artist. What are the best platforms to follow you and to contact you on? Uh, Instagram would be the by far the best way to reach out. Um, I'm, you know, at Nine Theory is my handle for everything. So it would be Twitter at Nine Theory, Twitter, you know, Facebook.com slash Nine Theory. I am never on Facebook anymore. I don't want to ever be on Facebook. So that's like the worst place you could ever hit me up. <laughs> um, emails good. are emails are good and I'm like barely on Twitter like I don't like to pay attention to that um, and I don't I'm not, I'm not on TikTok um, no not, it's like Instagram hit me up on Instagram that yep. would be the place Insta yeah. it is and for somebody who's interested in the music wants to find you if you're touring their local area or wants to download your tracks keep keep up to date on the new releases Spotify what, yeah, what else would you Spotify. Recommend? I mean, you could like my Bandcamp. Cool. Uh, I mean, basically, that's what's cool about the name Nine Theory is is there's no other Nine Theory. It so pops. if you look up Nine Theory anywhere that you like to listen to music, that it'll be me. Nine Theory dot com. Like I have my own website. Uh, is it spelled no, out or is it the number? No, nine? it's it's always a numeric nine and then the word theory. So that's always Nine Theory. New, numeric nine theory everywhere and uh yeah so you can, you know I, I definitely will get back to anyone who ever hits me up um very approachable cool so if you feel well, like you need to hit me up that's cool that's cool hit me up well i really appreciate you sharing your music in general but sharing your time here with me today and sharing your inspiration wisdom and you had a huge range of awesome tips and tricks uh, out there for pr producers or anybody who wants to learn music theory. And I just want to thank you, Gabe. Appreciate yeah, you and yeah. your time and your art. Hey, thank you. Uh, hopefully I didn't blab on too much like a, like a incoherent maniac on some of these, but uh, I appreciate you reaching out to me and even caring. I was surprised that someone you know, knew about me and cared to have me on their podcast. That's a first. <laughs> well, you dreamed about it. I'm not Jay Leno uh, as, no, as your no. childhood. Dude, I don't want to be on Jay Leno anymore, even uh, if he had a good. show. That, but, that's uh, like the, yeah. No, anyways, but this, I, but you have a cooler fulfill background. Your dreams, if I could fulfill your dreams somehow, 
your background's way cooler than Jay Leno. So. I appreciate that, yeah. And thank you for listening to my music. More than anything, anyone who listens to my music, thank you. That is that is incredible. I really, truly appreciate it. podcast with Michael Morahan. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss a single episode. And don't forget to share this podcast everywhere. Thanks for listening. And until next time, stay tuned. You are listening to Free Your Music.